of John's Gospel, and we get to reflect on how healing wins over brokenness. When we talk about healing, often the first thing that comes to mind is physical healing, some kind of injury or some kind of illness that is uh, healed and we are renewed in our body. But the kind of healing that happens uh, here in John 21, and probably the one that heals the deepest of all wounds that we have as human beings, is this is a relational healing. Uh, looking for illustrations uh, on forgiveness and reconciliation, the, uh, the resources abound everywhere. There's stories of and miraculous uh, people reconciling with others, and, and it gives us hope. It gives us hope. There's, uh, in the publication, Bits and Pieces, there's a story, I don't know if it's true or not, but in Spain, a uh, father and a son, they get into an argument, maybe it's a long-standing string of arguments, and the son finally says, forget it, I'm done, I'm out of here, and he runs away. And the father looks and looks and tries to find him and tries to find him, but to no avail. And uh, after a long time of searching, he puts an ad in the Madrid newspaper that says, Paco, my son, all is forgiven. Come home. Meet me at, on Saturday at 12 noon in front of the building of this newspaper. Hoping that his son would read it and come, to meet with his father, and so on Saturday he goes to the front of the newspaper, and what does he find but 800 hoppers, <laughs> all coming to find their father and face a time of reconciliation and forgiveness. Um, we're all like Papa, right? I think if we look back on our lives, there are some people that were estranged from. I mean, it's sad, but it's true. If we think each one of us in our own lives, in our own hearts, we can probably lift up one person or two people that, you know, we've just become estranged from, and we've never been able to put that relationship back together. Maybe sadly, oftentimes, the opportunity to put that relationship back together has been gone forever. And it's sad, and so, as we come to the last chapter of John's Gospel, we really see a time of reconciliation uh, between Jesus and Peter. He starts off, uh, first of all, sitting around a charcoal fire. Now, everything in these first, in the first sentence, everything in the first sentence is going to vividly recall almost every piece of Jesus and Peter's relationship together. So they're sitting around a charcoal fire, and if you've ever sat around a charcoal fire, it smells different than a regular fire. You know, so you know, sense of smell is like a really intense uh, straight line to your memory center and your brain center. Uh, and they're sitting around this charcoal fire. It's the same kind of charcoal fire that Peter was warming himself by in the courtyard of the high priest when he denied Jesus. And so there's that recollection there of the, the denial. There's also Jesus in his very first words, Simon, son of John. Simon, son of John. He repeats it these three times when he asks if he loves him. But it's the very way that Jesus first addresses Peter way back in the beginning of John's Gospel. You are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, Peter, which means rock. And if you uh, cross-reference that little interchange with Matthew, which happens a little later on in Matthew's Gospel, um, Jesus actually says this, on this rock I will build my church. You are Peter on this rock, because Cephas, Peter, means rock. And so, Peter has to be 
thinking about how he majestically failed at being the rock when faced with hard times and personal danger, he denies Jesus three times. Um, Jesus is recalling their beginning together, Simon, son of John. He's also recalling G Peter's boasting, right? Do you love me more than these? Pointing probably to the other disciples. Do you love me more than these? If you remember um, when Jesus says, somebody will betray me when they're receiving that difficult news. In John's gospel, Peter says, I will lay down my life for you. And the famous passage, Jesus says, I tell you, uh, before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. Once again, if you go over to Matthew, Peter gets really boastful in this same circumstance. Jesus says, all you all will become deserters because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. And Peter said, though all may become deserters because of you, I will never desert you. And Jesus, of course, responds with, very truly, I tell you, before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. And so these things are weighing on this relationship between Peter and Jesus. He asks three times, do you love me? Now, Bible scholars and almost everyone has heard how that corresponds to the three times that Peter denies him. So three times Jesus asks, do you love me? So, this is not just a personal reconciliation between Jesus and Peter, although he does give him this opportunity to be enfolded back into relationship with Jesus, to profess what he didn't profess when he denied him three times, this love. But it's not just this personal reconciliation. It's also the opportunity to commit, to live out the life that Jesus calls his disciples to, which is a life that is marked by just the very opposite type of action that, G that Peter had performed when he denied Jesus. Instead, in love, He lives a life that follows Jesus. Right? So, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Recalls John chapter 13. I give you a new command that you love one another. Just as I loved you, you should also love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, that you have loved one another. It's not just this personal love between Jesus and Peter, but a love that extends out into this new command. It's why in each of the three times, Simon, son of John, do you love me? It doesn't just end there, right? There's three things that follow that. Feed my sheep. Tend my sheep. Feed my lambs. They're slightly different each time, and... They're all synonymous. Love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. A love for Jesus means a love embraced in the community and beyond. John's gospel goes on in John chapter 14. Jesus is still in the same teaching. If you love me, you will keep my commands. And I will ask the Father, who will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the spirit of truth. 
They who have my commands and keep them are those who love me, Jesus says. And those who love me will be loved by my Father. And I will love them and reveal them myself to them. Those who love me will keep my word. And my Father will love them. And we will come to them and make our home with them. So this is not just a personal relationship that is being reconciled, that is being healed, but it's also a call to love one another as a show of our love for Jesus, as Peter's love for Jesus. And in the expression of that love and in the keeping of that command, we have the promise of the coming spirit of truth, of the coming of the Father and the Son will come and make their home with them. This completely reconciled and healed relationship that goes beyond the denial and extends forward forever. This is good news for all of us as well, by the way, right? Because in all of our own ways, shapes, and forms, we find ourselves from time to time breaking in our relationship with God, breaking in our relationship with one another, denying Jesus possibly, maybe not with our words, but many times in our actions and our priorities. And as Jesus gives Peter that opportunity for reconciliation, so we always have that opportunity for reconciliation. We also have the same calling that all the faithful have, that Peter has. Love one another as I have loved you. It's a sacrificial one. The hardest for the human condition to embrace, right? We are constantly wrestling with our free will and that which compels us to always put ourselves first. And wasn't that the root of Peter's denial, self-preservation? Isn't that the root of our denials when and where we make them for our own self-interest? Isn't it our inclinations to love ourselves first and then get on to loving others and loving Jesus some way on down the line? But to love Jesus fully empowers us and liberates us to love one another fully and to live in the world with a love like the one Jesus lived in the world with. It meant sacrificing his life. And as you read on in Peter, um, you, know, you may say, well, this, uh, this is a tough life that Peter's going to get called to. And it certainly is, right? I mean, if you know the history, Peter does wind up dying a martyr's death like so many others of those first followers. And he did so loving Jesus, loving others, and living that self-sacrificial love wherever we went. It's not going to mean that every one of Jesus' faithful folks who love him are going to die for him the way Peter did. But we certainly all have to die to self in order to live fully that love for God. And so in celebrating that healing wins over brokenness, we know that that healing comes at a cost. It came at the cost of Jesus' life. And here on the shore of the beach, over the charcoal fire, the love with which Jesus gave his life is in full effect as he gives Peter the opportunity to profess his love for him and to take up the mission to love, to love fully, to love deeply, to love others, and to be obedient in such a way that he lives that love wherever he goes. So it is as well for us as we are asked the question, do you love me? we have the opportunity to say, yes, Lord, I love you. And watch that same healing 
in our lives overflow so that we can be about the way that he has called us to as well. Feed my sheep. Tend my sheep. Feed my lambs. Let's pray. God, we are thankful for the relationships of love that we have and that strengthen us and that uplift us. And we grieve, Lord, because there are relationships that are broken in our lives <coughs> that we had hoped to reconcile, that we had desperately wanted to reconcile, that we couldn't, or that we wouldn't. And for some days, the opportunity is no longer there. But we know that by your great love, you have given us an ever-present opportunity to say, yes, Lord, I love you. And Peter had denied you three times, and so three times you asked him, do you love me? And Lord, whether we have denied you once or twice or a thousand times, by Christ's love, we have the opportunity to answer once, twice, or a thousand times. Yes, Lord, I love you. Be with us in our attempts to live out that great command to love one another. And by that witness, show the world what it means to live and to love fully and deeply. May we here in this community of faith and all other churches that bear your name be a witness and example in the world of that great love. We pray all this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. <clears throat>